Hello everyone, welcome to the CGHE webinar number 205. Uh, I am Yusuf Iqbal Oldach. Uh, I'm a recent doctoral graduate at Oxford University. Normally we were expecting Simon to introduce uh, the seminar, but he may be experiencing some technical issues. So he will join us in a bit, uh, we're hoping. So while we're waiting for Simon, I'll just go straight into my presentation uh, and start giving my talk. Sorry about this inconvenience. It's just, it has never happened before uh, as the IT friend uh, also told us. So let me just start my presentation and start talking about it. Um, I'll just share my screen. So, okay. So when Simon joins, he can just maybe hop in and just, uh, you know, take over the me mediation. So today I'll be talking about part of my doctoral research. Uh, and the title of my presentation is Self-Formation in International Higher Education. I'll be sharing some recent evidence from Turkish international students. So let me go straight into it. Here's my introduction slide. So higher education as self-formation is a relatively recent theory. Uh, the first papers were, pub on it, were published by Mar Simon Martinson. And I provide there the list, uh, like the references for the first couple of papers on this. Uh, the mainly self-formation theory is positioned against the adjustment paradigm. The adjustment paradigm, uh, you can hear me, right? I hope the microphone is working well. Yes, yeah. Good, good, good. So the, the theory, the self-formation theory is mainly positioned against the adjustment paradigm, well, which is a paradigm that has been prevalent, especially in the international higher education literature. According to this paradigm, international students are on a journey from their home culture to the host culture. The host culture is kind of seen as the norm. And the more students adjust to this culture, like acculturate to this culture, the better they will be, the more successful, etc. That's the main idea in this paradigm. Also, self-formation theory is against human capital approach as well, in the sense that international higher education experience is much more than just increased earnings afterwards or uh, like better job prospects afterwards. What self-formation theory emphasizes, puts forward is personal agency. Students are the captains of their ships. And also it emphasizes holistic development. As I mentioned, it's not just about you know, getting better job prospects afterwards, but like the intercultural experiences that you go through, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, it also emphasizes reflexivity. Students go through self-formation reflexively. They reflect on their journey on the way. Uh, the main idea is that only the learner does the actual learning. So as I mentioned earlier on, this theory is relatively recent. Few papers were pu published on it, although we see an, it, an increasing trend on studies that focus on self-formation. And this doctoral work is one of the early studies to empirically investigate it and provide evidence for it and to understand how it may be working. So when you're studying a theory that is relatively new, what, what you need to do is like a situ situated in a theoretical framework. So to understand self-formation theory, I reviewed agency theories in the literature. Uh, and I chose uh, the ones that proposed by B.S. and Tether, the ecological approach to agency. So in this agency perspective that I used in the study is here you can see I provide a, like a, a shape for it. As you can see in the middle, there is a triangle and it says self-formation in international higher education. Basically, self-formation in international higher education has three dimensions. The first one, the most important one is of course, individuals, actors which are conceptualized as the international higher education graduates in the study. I'll give more details about the participants in a bit. So let's just continue from here. So individuals go through self-formation in international higher education through context and within a temporality. And context, as you can see, the second dimension is conceptualized as different destination countries, which may make a difference in students' self-formation uh, process. And temporality is conceptualized in the study as before, during, and after international student mobility. So let me talk about the purpose. Here is the research question. Uh, normally in my thesis, I have one more research question, for, but for the sake of being time conscious, I'll be 
focusing on one of them. Uh, let me read it for you. How do Turkish young adults who completed their degrees abroad explain their self-formation in international higher education? So here you can see I focus on young adults only, which means that my participants were aged from 20 to 35. This was based on the assumption that, let's say, senior people may have a different perspective on their self-formation process. So I wanted to limit this to an uh, to a uh, you know cycle looking from the psychological literature. So let me briefly go through my methods. Um, this is a qualitative study, uh, and it has a biographical dimension in it. What do I mean by biographical dimension? Well, it'll be clear in the next bullet point. For data collection, I used semi-structured interviews and lifetime line forms. And lifetime line forms were served multiple purposes. One purpose is that uh, they prompted the participant before the interview. I wanted them to, you know, remember that reflexivity is important for self self formation. So I wanted them to go through a reflexive process before coming the interview. So I sent these forms one week before the interview uh, and they provided it and sent it back to me before the interview. And during the interview, these forms were useful in the sense that they structured the interview, especially at the beginning of it. Uh, I did not intervene much. I just asked them, can you go through your lifetime line form in a more detailed way, just expand on it. So this is the part where they narratively talk about their life story, whatever happened up until that point. And I do not intervene. Afterwards, I start uh, asking probing questions and I start using my semi-structured interviews. For data analysis, I use thematic analysis and I use both inductive and deductive approaches. In terms of methodology, I need to mention one more uh, important topic. This is an international comparative study. Uh, in which I, I made fieldwork trips to five countries. Uh, and I'm very grateful for BASE, British, British Association for International and Comparative Education for the fieldwork grant. Otherwise, this would not be possible. Uh, so let me just go through the countries that I visited for this study. The, uh, and the photos denote them, actually. So the one on the top left is a photo from London, United Kingdom. The one on the top right is Baku, Azerbaijan. The one on the bottom left is Sofia, Bulgaria. And the one on the bottom right is Berlin, Germany. And the one on the center is Turkey, Istanbul, where I interviewed returnee graduates. So we don't have any copyright issues with these photos because I took them myself when I was doing the field trips. Uh, these countries may look arbitrary for you when you, like, when you look at them in the first place, but they are not. I chose these countries based on UNESCO data. I obtained the list of top 10 destinations for Turkish international higher education students studying abroad. And from top 10, I didn't go for the like, top four destinations. I chose the ones that differed the most. So these four destination countries were uh, differed the most based on certain criteria, such as uh, education quality, like historic cultural ties with Turkish students and you know, their governance structures, this, you know, the civil civic values in them, et cetera. So I tried to choose the ones that differed uh, as much as possible. Um, eventually, I ended up having 50 participants uh, interviewed in five different countries. I, we can talk about this more like in terms of details, et cetera, afterwards. Uh, but for the sake of being time conscious, maybe let's move on to the next slide. So um, let me start talking about findings. I will share the findings under three main headings. Uh, and I call these three headings as the educational domain of self-formation, the social domain of self-formation, and the civic domain of self-formation. So these categories, they were not pre-established before the fieldworks took place. Rather, they emerged as uh, from the data as I kept going. It seemed to me that self-formation happens through at least through these three domains. And by domain, I mean sphere of activity influence, you know, no need to go very complicated with that. Um, and by the way, these are by no means exhaustive in nature. Like it's just showing that the data I have says three domains and then there may be more, or we can discuss that, you know, they may be different in nature. So um, let me start with the first domain then, the educational domain. Um, under this category, I'll just share a few, uh, let's say, themes that emerged that relate to educational domain that the participants kept talking about again and again. So one of the themes is international higher education as a milestone in one's life trajectory. So the participants kept saying the importance of higher education and how they kind of, how that kind of 
influence their life trajectory, their self-formation process. Let me read the first quote and it may become clearer for us. Uh, this is Atakan who studied in Azerbaijan. Uh, I'm quoting him. There are two or three turning points in one's life. The university, to be more specific, the department you choose, the course you've taken at your department, the education you've received, and all the knowledge you've acquired. That's what drives your real life. I mean, going to university is your first step into real life because university is actually the middle of one's life. So here, he doesn't mean literally like that it's middle of one's life, but to express its importance, it's like a, it's a Turkish expression. So here's another, another quote from Yashar who studied in UK. Let me just quickly read and then uh, I will just explain it a bit. Higher education is a much freer environment than any other environment before it. You can't even decide for yourself how to dress in high school. You see, this university is seen by almost all participants as like the most, the freer environment that comes, that precedes anything before it. So that freedom, uh, exponential increase in freedom triggers self-formation. And so that the person becomes the people they are. They in, in some ways different from the society that they live in and in some ways similar to it. And students go, have, this happens through self-formation. So here I wanted to provide um, like a visual data about the same theme, which is international higher education being a milestone in one's life trajectory. So you see, I provide here a sample life timeline forms. Uh, well, the texts are not very visible, but it's okay. The, the, the one, and they're in Turkish as well, but the, except the one that I provided the translation on the second one on the left. What I'm trying to show you here is that international higher education is almost always, no, not almost, it's always mentioned in these uh, timeline forms. And I did not even ask for it. I just asked, can you tell us about the important points in your life? And they mostly are mentioned towards the middle of it. Like uh, it's, and that's probably because the participants were young adults. If we chose, for example, senior people, they probably would mention it earlier on in, the, in their uh, life timeline forms. But anyway, my argument is that they would still mention it because it's, it is a very influential part in one's life. Another point is, is this, this kept coming from the participants as well. The guiding role of university for self-forming students. Let me read the quote and it may be clearer afterwards. Nowadays, university departments no longer train you to perform a predetermined professional line of work. Nowadays, they educate you so that you find your own path and try things. With such events and networking opportunities, etc., the university lets you work on whatever, whatever interests you. It helps you find your direction. This was mentioned again and again by the participants. So here, the university, when you look at university education through the lens of self-formation, like when you put agency at the center, what you see, you know, the, the guiding role of universities seem to come to the fore. This does not, you know, in, I don't intend here to uh, give an exhaustive uh, role, discuss the exhaustive role of universities, but guiding role of universities seems to come to the fore. Like they provide, for example, these social activities, etc., the classes that you can choose from. And the students make those choices and try new things. And in, in that process, they define higher education as a guidance, you know, its guiding role for their self-formation process. And also what is interesting uh, from the findings is that I saw this contextual differences in the approach to learning. So because of the nature of the data, we cannot generalize this, but it seemed like there seems there seemed to be a pattern emerging from those who studied in Azerbaijan and those who studied in Germany and the UK, interestingly. Let me read the quotes and then I will elaborate on them more. So for example, this is Fatih who studied in Germany. He says, Germany taught me how to learn. They never teach anything. They give you the arguments. This and this are the sources, play with them. They guide you. In the advanced stages, they won't even guide you. Figure it out yourself, just like that. So, for example, the, the, the next quote as well supports this. This is, again, another student from Germany. I note, and he also compares his education in Turkey with Germany, which might be helpful for us. I noticed this distinction after going abroad for my master's. What we call education and teaching in Turkey is, it'll be an interesting wording, but spoon feeding students with information. But after I went to Germany, I realized that university is not a place that teaches information to people, but a place that teaches how to evaluate, utilize information. So now 
let's contrast these to the quotations here from two different students who studied in Azerbaijan. For example, the first one, let me read it for you. University educates everyone, everyone goes through it and begins to work afterwards. It would be beneficial on behalf of the country, the nation or the world overall, if a good or knowledgeable individual were educated there. So you see the continuous mention of, you know, teachers educating people, students should be educated, you know, so that they can be beneficial to others. So there's this positioning of students as more like a learners, like the individuals that needs to be taught in the educational context here. Let me read the next one as well. It'll be clearer, I think. So Melis, this is, and she also studied in Azerbaijan. She says, they even check the notes you kept during classes. Were you taking notes or not? We were getting points from that too. Also, there was no concept of being absent. If you are not present at a total of 50 classes, you would automatically be kicked out. Of course, everyone's experience is different, like different, even if they're in the same university. But it seems like uh, from the students who studied in Azerbaijan, um, it was more like they're positioned as passive learners and teachers are there to teach them. But whereas if you go to the previous slide in Germany and those who study in the UK as well, they kept saying that, it's the student that learns and it's like, it's their responsibility. If they don't learn it, it's not the instructor that's, you know, that uh, is not very much responsible as it is mentioned in Azerbaijan. It's an interesting uh, contrast, which, you know, may help us, you know, prompt us fu future research for comparison, et cetera. Uh, since it's relevant to self-formation, I wanted to share it with you. So, um, let's move to the second domain that I mentioned, the social domain of self-formation. So the social domain of self-formation is about daily, uh, social day-to-day -day interactions with other students in the international higher education experience and how that influence us, how that uh, shape our self-formation. So I wanna start with this theme, uh, bridging, bridging cultures and worldviews. When you meet people in day-to-day -day social activities, you end up uh, you know, getting to know new cultures and the worldviews. Let me read the first quote and it'll be clearer. This is Alpa Slan who studied in Germany. No matter how open-minded you say you are, you continue some part of, of your some parts of your life by habit. And these are parts of the cultural habits of the society you live in. But when you build friendships with members of a foreign community, you have to take yourself out of the habits of your own society. Um, let me just read the next quote as well as it supports this. This is another student studied in Germany. He says, you see, for example, how a Chinese person works, how he lives. It is different when you see it by experiencing it firsthand and different when you hear it, uh, hear about it from news and your surroundings. And you see, that that's the thing that kept almost everyone in the participants saying, said, it's different when you experience living with different people together rather than learning about them from the news. And international higher education just gives you that. It kind of almost forces you. You find yourself in this new context and you have to interact with them. And that has an effect on your self-formation. So now that Simon, I guess, is not here, maybe I should take the role to say that, you know, any questions, please write them in the chat box. We'll have a look at them after the presentation. Um, okay, let me continue. So becoming a better intercultural communicator, it has also come up with many uh, participants. For example, this student who studied in Germany says, the communication skills of someone who has not been to abroad with foreign people would be very different from that of someone who has lived with them for a while. After all, you learn to be tolerant. The religion of the other person is important, what they eat and drink. So uh, you see like you may not be, you may not be uh, conscious about, conscious that other people may drink the same things that you drink or they have a different perspective toward things. But studying abroad, pushes you towards this and you transform yourself accordingly. And uh, the next quote also supports this. And this was, you know, this that one from is Bulgaria. And we can see quotes about this, opinions about this from Azerbaijan, all the context of this study. So it was not context dependent, this one. Let me, let me just move to the next slide to be time conscious. Another thing within social domain is extracurricular activities. I thought, putting extracurricular activities under this domain would be important because it's also related to what you do in your daily, daily, daily social uh, activities. And I provide here one example from a student who studied in Azerbaijan. He says, let me read it for you. I joined the art of carpet weaving and painting. I did not have the 
have a network that did these in Turkey. Here I got to meet people who are good at what they do. They invite us and we go join them. So you see this person started doing arts in higher education. But what is more interesting in, about this person is that he didn't even like arts before. Let me just read the next quote. I'm a person who values art. I understood this better when I got into it. I used to find it repulsive, like what's the point of painting or sculpting? But when I saw that the artist worked on the notes one by one and even used the magnifying lens for some parts, I said to myself that this is very delicate and sophisticated work. So you see in the international higher education literature, going abroad and you know, losing the support network that you have, the friendships that you, know, you leave them behind when you go, that is seen as a challenge. Well, it is, it is a challenge, yes, but it is, at, it is at the same time an opportunity, a positive one. You may end up maybe making new friends and they may help you learn new things and transform yourself. In this person, for example, he started being as a, someone who dislikes art to becoming an artist himself now that he does his carpet weaving and painting. So let's move to the last domain of self-formation, uh, which is civic domain. So civic domain is about, as a student, when you go abroad for a degree education, uh, you find yourself in the middle of a new society, new civic values. Um, and it's very, you, uh, and by living there for an extended period, you learn new things, you form yourself. Uh, I had many, like five other themes to discuss under civic domain, but I'll just focus on one of them here too, so that maybe I can delve into more detail. So apprenticeship in the new worldviews I discuss here is, builds on one of my supervisors term that she coined, apprenticeship in democracies, um, Maya chang work. But here I take a more descriptive stance because as I mentioned, some of the participants studied in a country that is less democratic than their own country. Some others studied in countries that are more democratic. And it's not just about democracy. Uh, the countries had you know, different civic uh, understandings, perspectives, and different governing structures. So let me start with this person, Rana, who studied in Azerbaijan. Uh, I'll just read it for you. She says, capitalism is recent in Azerbaijan. This is a culture that I've, I have never seen before. That was the thing that changed me. You grow up with capitalism here and you see socialism there, she means Azerbaijan. We've always been told that socialism is bad. We characterize socialism as an unwanted regime that people are forcefully held part of. Then you go there and hear people say they were very happy back then. They even say they wish the system hadn't fallen apart. So that's her perception of you know, what, recent, what is going on in Azerbaijan. And let's contrast that quotation with this one. This Melis also studied in Azerbaijan in the same city, uh, in the same department, but, and, and also they're from Istanbul as well. They both moved to Azerbaijan from Istanbul. She says, when we first went there, Azerbaijan, they were recently attempting to transition to capitalism. It was incredible to see that transition. I saw that communism is not something like the communists in Turkey dream of. So here we can see one, one, th one interesting thing is that one of them talks about the same governing structure in, some, in the same country as socialism, and the others uses communism for it. This kind of shows up that they may be a bit liberal in the, in the words they choose to explain the same thing. Uh, another thing is one seems to have developed a positive stance to what's going on in Azerbaijan and liked it and, and identified it as socialism. The other uh, developed a negative stance to it. She, Melis, this one provides a lot more details in the interview as well, but I wanted to just contrast them and try to keep it uh, short. So this kind of shows us that it is the reflexive agency that makes a difference still, like even although they're in the same context, you know, many, they share the many similarities. We'll come back to this maybe in the discussion afterwards. So the civic domain, another example, this one is a person who studied in Germany. Um, this is Ahmed. Let me just, here we will see a person who, uh, was, let's, what's the word? encounters the social democracy in Germany and how he reacts. He says, I always had in my mind that capitalism does not work, but I thought, but I couldn't call myself a socialist or anti-capitalist because although I could think and question that capitalism does not work, I could never prove it to myself. After I came here, Germany, I was able to develop these thoughts more easily. So um, you see like he, he, the social democracy in Germany seems to have influenced him. He also gives more details about how this works. Like, let me just try to summarize this quote to be time conscious. So he basically says being embedded in that, uh, you know, the second quotation, being embedded in that context, talking to people around him, 
uh, made a difference that uh, helped him form new perspective, transform himself, his thinking about this. Uh, and, and in the end, the last sentence, he says, I learned that accessing alternative information can be easy. Well, it has become easy for him because he he's now in living in an alternative different country than that the one he has been living before. Uh, but this gives us some clue about how self-formation might work. So I wanted to give last example from the UK, like to give a, a, from every perspective. Again, uh, apprenticeship in new worldviews. This is Omer who studied in the UK. He says, my coming to the UK and learning English had a profound impact on my developing and understanding of the world. I watched objective documentaries. I listened impartially, objectively, because there's some truth to be taken from all sides. I developed a certain perception, a certain understanding. So here, um, yes, he says he developed an objective perspective, which probably is true in his uh, perspective. But what is, I think, important here is that him learning, forming a new worldview through the English language and through the sources that are created in this English world. That's a good example of you know, what, how apprenticeship in new worldviews may work. He's, he's basically watching uh, these things happen after he learned English and started learning things accordingly. So the last slide before conclusions, um, again, apprenticeship in new worldviews. One in five participants uh, discussed that they become uh, more global citizens. Uh, not everyone though, one in five. Let me read the first one, it may become clearer. Uh, this is Aysel, who studied in the UK. She says, there's a more global Aysel now, a more world citizen Aysel. I was never a highly nationalist person. I was not like, I am a Turk, I was born here and I'm from here. But now it is more like these borders seem meaningless to me. I mean, I was born here, but so what? I could have been born a thousand kilometers further away or in a different place. This does not say much about me. What is interesting about you know, this one in five, well, which makes 10 in 50 participants is that um, they, are, they, they study in the UK and Germany mostly. I did not hear uh, people who studied in Azerbaijan or Bulgaria saying that, hey, I'm a more global citizen now. Well, it was less pronounced at least, which is interesting. And I need to mention as well that not everyone who studied in the UK and Germany says this. But those who say are in, who studied in Germany and UK, I think we should talk about you know the selection, selective part of this as well. Like maybe those who went to study in Azerbaijan in the beginning were different people, and they may not maybe they were not pretty much open to becoming global citizens, so called. The, it's very it's a discussed topic and in, in a contended topic in the literature anyway. So let me let me read the last quotation and then I'll move on to the next slide. This is. Mustafa, who studied in Germany, he says, you evaluate yourself differently depending on how close you are to the world. So when you look at Turkey, for example, you see an unnecessary confidence, unnecessary nationalism. Or let me tell you in the simplest terms, I too thought that the best food in the world was in Turkey. But as I got to know the world, I was like, hold on a second. So it's like a funny uh, expression that he used there. So concluding remarks. Um, I tried to maybe bombard you with evidence from quotations. I hope I was able to you know, make it clearer. But basically, some of the main arguments are these. International higher education is not just about what happens in the classes. So the social and civic domains of self-formation were evident in the quotations. And these seems to be like overlooked overall in the literature. They mostly focus on you know, what they have learned. Let's quantify that. You know, human capital approach, they will have better opportunities after, afterwards. But this can be compared to Biesta's, uh, you know, he proposes these functions of education. And in that he says, there is qualification, but at the same time, socialization and subjectification. So of course, these three uh, are not the same the, with the domains I propose. But what, what I mean here is that he also emphasized that there's more, more than just qualifications, more than just education aspect or, uh, in going on in education, let's say. Agency, uh, these students are the captains of their ships. They steer the course of their own lives, albeit under conditions like context that conditions them. This was evident, for example, let's say on those two students who went to Azerbaijan, but they ended up forming different worldviews or similar, uh, similar things happen in the you know, social and educational domain as well. But this does not mean that context is not important at all. Uh, in fact, it, it, it is important and it conditions agency. For example, like 
you see like contextual differences in the education, like one country has different perspective towards education and positions students differently, and the other has a different perspective to it. Temporality, uh, like this was, uh, like I tried to emphasize this as well, like for example, that example from the student from the extracurricular activities, you see that person before his international higher education experience, um, he didn't even like arts. During his international higher education experience, he started joining those social activities, extracurricular activities, and started developing a different stance. And afterwards, after graduation, he's, he's now an artist himself. He does arts uh, on a regular basis, the way he explained to me. So the, these findings do not intend to negate the structural inequalities among universities or country contexts. I need to acknowledge this. In fact, you know, the, the opportunities provided by you know, different countries, the prestige of the university, they may differ. But I still would like to underline the role of agency here. It's the agency that makes a larger difference, I think, because someone may be a graduate of a very prestigious university, etc., in the world. And the other one might, st might study in their home country in an average university, but still work hard, use their agency to maybe become a happier person or more successful person or someone who creates value for others, etc., however you define it. So the agency, I want to highlight that, which is kind of the essence of self-promotion theory, I think. So thank you for your time. Uh, these are my references. Uh, you can reach me anytime with these email and social media, I guess. So I haven't had a chance to look at the questions, but let me just try to open them. So Yusuf, um, I'm back with you now, so I can- uh, Oh, that's I'm great. Very that's sorry great. to say I lost internet access about uh, seven minutes to uh, two and then have just recovered, recovered for the last sort of 30% of your presentation. Um, so I'm just, I've just composed a, um, uh, you know, a question list on the basis of what people have told me about what came in in the chat and also what's come in since I arrived back. And let me say it's a great topic and a great presentation because I do know what you said because um, I've read your doctoral thesis and, um, and uh, in fact, I had the pleasure of examining it and we passed it without amendment. So uh, you know, which is the highest grade, really. So, um, you know, it's really significant work, and uh, it's because it's new work, and you know, you've broken new ground with um, the uh, particularly the focus on social and civic aspects of self formation, and you've put self formation in a relational context in a social environment, uh, and you've done that in a comparative way, so that we see it doesn't work out the same in every case. It's it's a different social environment, both in the country of education and in the country of origin when people go back it has, you know, their experience has different shaping effects on what happens to them. So I'm going to ask you one question and then I'm going to go to Victorita, then Kelba, then So Yong, then uh, Samuel Sung, and then Hong Wei. Um, and my question is this, um, now you've opened up this civic and social dimension, um, where do you think research on self-formation can go from here in those areas? Um. I mean, what would you That's, advise someone new who came into the mm -hmm. research, want to do something on self-formation? What would you advise them to do? A next well, that's a, Yeah, that's a great question, actually. And uh, that's true. Like in the literature, we, we don't see them much, they, especially in the mobility literature. They don't focus on much the civic aspect or social aspect of them. I think uh, for the newcomers, or <laughs> I myself am a young person anyway, but I'll try to give some advice. Basically, um, it's important to think about those aspects as well and keeping a broader perspective to it. So uh, I have colleagues that study this in the academic domain, which is very significant, but we should maybe focus on, you know, new research may focus on different domains of it as well. Um, and I had a, maybe a bit exploratory perspective in this research because it's like one of the, you know, an early study on this, but the following next studies can look at my study and maybe have a more detailed, more specific look at it. Uh, maybe focusing on some aspect for, uh, let's say in the social domain, how extracurricular activities may uh, make a difference in self-formation and how students encounter with the other, for example. Um, that could be one approach and mm -hmm. many other can be, I think, advised. It can be suggested at this point. So you can look at almost any, every aspect of education, uh, but through the self-formation lens, it sort of changes the way we think about all of the things we've thought about before, really. Yeah. Now no, no, to think about them differently. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And putting agency at the center, yeah. uh, that's putting I think what the... makes cell formation is a bit different from the others, but because although, you know, we're not saying they're completely wrong, like, uh, but uh, most of the studies, they focus on the structural factors, the conditioning factors, the context, etc. But as Foucault says, individuals, students can ri raise about their context. And this is through their agency. Of course, we're not talking about, you know, that neoliberal dream where, you know, if you work hard, you can achieve anything. That's not the point here. The point here is that as, you know, Zygmunt Bauman or Giddens has pointed out, the modern world is a liquid world. And it's like, there are lots of uncertainties in it. And in those uncertainties, students who steer the course of their own lives, self-formation becomes an important topic to be discussed, to be studied. Thanks, that's really good. Um, now. We've got, also got Zach Spire and Paolo Iris on the call list. I'll take as many as I can on a one-to-one -one basis, and then we'll move into the group of questions, and you'll get a group answer at the end. Um, Victorita first. Victorita Triff. Hi. Uh, welcome, Simon. Uh, congratulations, Yusuf. Uh, I want Thank to you. ask you, uh, what do you think the acculturation as a self adaptation to, uh, to life according to international students thank you thank, thank you so yeah acculturation adaptation uh, in this study like i am for example what what i'm suggesting is not that they don't exist they are there but in that literature the way they position the students they're like in deficient position the way they need to acculturate to this new uh, uh, society, that perspective uh, is kind of, I think, can be improved. And with cell formation, for example, uh, the, uh, they may be, for example, acculturating, which, uh, for example, Simon discusses this in his, one of his papers as hybridization and multiplicity. So like they may be building a new self depending on the things they encounter in the new uh, cross-cultural atmosphere, or they may become multiple people. It's like in the host country or home country, they may become different people in a multiple way. But I think the difference here is that the agency that you know the person has should be highlighted here because they don't just passively acculturate to the system. Uh, a lot of us who have studied abroad, they would probably just say, oh yes, I studied in this country, but I did not become, became like the people living there automatically. It was not a passive process. You go through a reflexivity, and that's how you, um, you know, improve yourself. You go through with your self transformation. Thanks. I hope that answers. Thank you, Victor, and thanks, Yusuf, for the answer. Kelba, Kelba Tazini, please. Hi. Thank you for your presentation. I was just wondering because you talked about commonalities within the context. Um, I was wondering if you were looking also at intersectional identities uh, between if participants who shared intersectional uh, similar intersectional identities also had similar responses as well in terms of gender, sexual orientation, uh, social class and or other um, intersectional identities as well as uh, whether they were part of a, a network of Turkish students as well in those countries and that actually played a role in their self-formation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. So the first part, um, uh, I did not specifically look at intersectional identities, um, but they did come up in a few circumstances, like because it has been, I think, important in shaping their life stories, like they discussed about that. So uh, like that is important for them, but like basically I did not make a comparison or uh, detailed uh analysis of this for those that did mention about it like did dwell on it, it it's it's new, like international higher education again is an immensely strong part of it basically uh for example he said thanks to his international higher education he was able to leave his previous network and like kind of make new ones in the new uh host country and that kind of make him behave the, the person that he feels like and that kind of uh helped him form his new identity in the new uh, uh, new place, new country, et cetera. Uh, the, the other question that you had, uh, what, what was it about the last one? 
if there were a lot of uh, local networks of Turkish students? Uh, yeah, yeah. Good question. So, like, I noticed that especially like the difference. Like, I had four destination countries, but those who studied in Germany, we saw as I saw a strong uh, distinction. Some of them were clearly di differentiating themselves from the Turkish society there. In fact, they had to like they explained you know they they were explained to me all of them like in their da daily lives whenever they see let's say a local person in germany etc they say hey we're not one of those turks we're different etc it was an interesting dynamic there they were trying to avoid mostly you know to uh, be part of the society there and in the Ger the specific context of germany there was a different situation like berlin is the country that is the city that hosts most Turks after Istanbul, they say. So like there's a huge diaspora there and the, the existing diaspora went to Germany for a different purpose. They were working class people mostly and they moved to obtain jobs. But these people we're talking about are highly educated, you know, university educated people going there for masters, PhDs. And they told me that they always had this feeling that they had to differentiate themselves from the Turkish people that came beforehand. And I think that kind of reflected on their activity. They probably tried to, you know, hang out, even if they hang out with other Turks, they, they probably were university students than the other ones. But some did tell me, like maybe a minority, that they were hanging out with uh, Turks only. But I think that was minority. It was We see more of a mingling, mingling with, between cultures and different perspectives. Perfect, thank you so much. And thank you, thank you, Kelbo, and thank you, Yusuf, for the answer. Um, Soyong is next. Soyong Lee. Thank you, Simon, and thank you, Yusuf, for your excellent presentation. It's just so good to see you in this CG seminar. So my question is very simple, and it's about self-formation, the usage of self-formation um, concepts in your study. So I was wondering if your self-formation concepts in your study is a framework or findings or research object. So if it is the framework that you used for your study, then you wouldn't need to like provide evidence for the for self-formation because it's like assumption, right? And if it is a finding that emerged from your like interview data, you wouldn't need to like show self-formation as your framework at that, I don't know, the background of your research at the beginning. So if it is uh, something like research objects in your study, how your study, how does your study contribute to the current self-formation discourse or current self-formation research um, by providing new findings, for example, like how do you elaborate it? Yeah, thank you very much, Kelsey. So, sorry, <laughs> so Yang. So, so Yang is another expert on self-formation. <laughs> She's doing her PhD on this topic as well. So the hardest questions comes from her always. <laughs> but yeah, that's a very important question. So in my uh, doctoral research, um, I saw self-formation, I see it as like as a new perspective and, and a new better understanding of how, how to understand students, how they go through that experience of international higher education. So that's the way I position it. It's a theory and it positions students at the center rather than seeing them as uh, passive adjusters or passive you know, acculturators or just those who went there for increased job opportunities. It's more than that. So self-formation theory provides that perspective and it kind of started a new paradigm in the literature as well, uh, be, uh, you know, showing that uh, students are active uh, individuals actually. They, by the way, this is not, the idea itself is not completely new because like the, putting a self at the center and personal development, for example, has been exi has existed in, let's say, East Asian culture, for example, Confucianism, or like uh, in the Western perspectives, like Bildung, etc. They were there. But the understanding of this and using it in higher education, that's the new perspective, I think, in this and embedding it in the international higher education literature. That's the way uh, I think I see self-formation. And that's how I, I see it as a theory. And I try to understand, make it more concrete with my agency perspective, which I explained in the beginning, uh, which is ecological perspective to it. I, hope no, I, think, I, think, I think self-formation idea is just uh, a way of 
of talking about things we already talked about. So it's not finding mm -hmm. new phenomena exactly. Yeah. What it is doing is, is it's changing our view of the learning process. Uh, it's shifting from the idea that students are kind of like vessels that are filled by external agents to people who process things entirely themselves um, and, and, and take things in from their environment, including other agents. Um, and just once you make that simple um, statement, you see the learning process differently. You see, you center it on a first and beginning and end on the individual um, agent uh, and everything else is related to that rather than everything being related to the curriculum or everything related to the teacher. Um, so it's just that move. I think that's all the self-formation perspective is. So it's just a conceptual framework. Um, it's, 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 you know, it's like the difference in a political system between focusing on democracy or focusing, focusing on wise elite decisions. If you take the democracy perspective, everything gets thought of in terms of the accountability, you know, and so on. If you take the elite decision-making perspective, everything's thought of in terms of rational judgment of the person who's most equipped to decide. So it's just the way you think about education. It's such what self-formation is. Um, and that's why everyone got into it because, and the way they did in the last few years, because it, 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 uh, it seems to fit with the times. You know, the idea that the person concerned is responsible for their own learning fits with our notions, our modern notions about agency, where we're expecting people to develop themselves, form themselves in all kinds of ways, you know, from consumption to themselves as, as a political decision makers, to people who design their own careers, people who manage their own appearance, you know, in different ways, their bodies, their, 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 their fashion. I mean, in all kinds of ways, we imagine people forming their own self. It's become a modern trope. And this is simply transporting that into education and saying this is yeah. how we're going to see education now um mm -hmm. so it's not it's not a finding exactly except that agency obviously in its different forms is always a finding you know you find when you study um agency you find different things about it every time i think um so agency is where the empirical uh as one of the and agency and environment interaction is other and individual social interaction and so on they're they're where we find findings if you like but the perspective of self formation is not itself a finding, and I think you were right to highlight that point. It's a very good question. I mean, you know, what are we look? What are we doing here? You know, is it a framework? Is it a finding, and so on? Very nice question, uh, and I can see that because you're halfway through your doctoral study, it's a very important question for you to try and get to grips with. Now, the next person on the list is Samuel Tsang, and um, after I think what we'll do now, because I talk too much, is take a group of questions. And, um, and, and give Yusuf a chance to do a, a group reply. So first one will be Samuel, and then I'll ask Hongwei, and then Zach Spire, and then Paolo Iras to come in. So I'm um, Samuel first. Thank you so much, Simon. Uh, Yusuf, thank you so much for the talk, and I really appreciate it. I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on the role of language, you know, on self-formation in higher education for people who study abroad. I'm just wondering if your data has captured anything specifically, you know, to that. You know, the reason why I'm asking this question is because studying abroad, you know, sometimes means like acquiring and constructing knowledge in a, like a second or foreign language, and that may be related to self-formation. So I'm just wondering if you can share any sort of insight, you know, on that. Thank you. So that's a, that's a big question, an important question. Um, so ho hang on to it, though. I'll, I'll bring the others in, but don't forget the language question because it's the first one. The others might displace it, but let's make sure we answer that question. Hongwei um, is next. Hongwei Gu. Um, thanks to, to um, Yusuf for his appropriate work. My question is, uh, well, many international students in Turkey accept there are challenges in communication. So my question is, should there be a short-term or long-term strategy to deal with this? Thank you. Okay, hang on there, Yusuf. Um, Zach, Zach Spire is next. A, a regular questioner like Hongwei. Uh, Yusuf, thank you so much for this. This is great work. My question is if your respondents or participants expressed any ideas or factors that influence their decision to go abroad and be an international student as part of their self-construction um, or co-constructive work um, in forming themselves. Thank you. Okay, so hang on to that one. 
Uh, take your time with the answer. You've got enough time, I think. The final question is coming from Paula Eres. Paula. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Yusef, for, for your work and for your research. Um, very, very relevant. Uh, and uh, I thought your conceptual framework was very um, pertinent here and very refreshing, actually. Um, yeah, my question is actually very similar to Samuel, uh, to Samuel's question about language, but he was asking about, you know, uh, going abroad and learning a new language. So I'll just add another layer. Uh, I don't know the demographics of the four destinations that you researched in terms of uh, which other international students would be there. So did you find any evidence of the role of language in their self-formation, be it English as a medium of instruction or any other languages, not necessarily English? So was language one of the elements of their self-formation at the end, similar to Samuel's question? Thank you. Can't hear you, Simon. If, um, you've got three themes there to answer and four questions. Um, so take your time and take it away. Okay, thank you. So we, well, I'll start with the language issue then, which was mentioned by uh, Paola and my friend, uh, my friend there. Uh, so basically, Samuel. Uh, language Samuel. Yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> he's just talking. So language is has been has came up again and again actually in the in the interviews uh, and it seems to have an impact on self-formation and basically when it is most evident is when they don't know the language that's most most evident uh, when they came up for example in for this did not came up much in the UK for example those who studied in the UK because most people in Turkey they start you know by learning language English so English has not been much of a problem in Azerbaijan, we did not see this either. You see the contextual differences because Azerbaijan is almost mutually understandable for Turkish people. So they don't even need to go through language classes before. It's just small differences between two languages. So in Bulgaria, they mostly studied in English speaking uh, universities. I think they are making an effort to that. But in Germany, especially, the classes were in German as well. So. Uh, and the society was speaking a very different language and not everyone in Turkey starts learning German from like their ch childhood, etc. There are a few high schools that you know, teach use in German as a language instruction. Uh, it's in the minority part. So what happened is that a lot of participants who studied in Germany said, well, language has been a strong barrier, not just in the classes, but in social domain of self-formation or like Civic domain is mostly uh, okay, but social domain, like when they, for example, want to meet with local German people there, you know, become friends with them, etc. It's just, you know, they're new recent learners of this language. And the German people, uh, this was an interesting finding. They were like, they would just in automatically compare them to the diaspora of Turkish people who went there for like maybe uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, and they would just say, hey, you've been living in Germany for so long and you still can't even speak German. So like Turkish people were especially aware, self-aware of, you know, trying to speak good German uh, in Germany. And if they weren't that good, they would feel shy. Most of them told me, not all of them, of course, but most of them, because there's this immediate assumption that, hey, you've been living here your whole life, your whole life and you haven't learned German. But in fact, probably they were maybe second year, third year, you know, recently graduated people. They're just trying to figure out, they're trying, giving their best to learn language. So in that sense, language, when they don't know it, became a big uh, issue there. Um, maybe to move on to the next question. So challenges in communication were highlighted by Hongwei. Um, that's an issue, yes. Um, like some students, especially in, when we look at the literature, academic literature on this, uh, some people with different cultural backgrounds may have more problems with, uh, you know, getting to know, getting to communicate, some people less. And there are different people ascribe this to different uh, aspects. Some say, oh, there's cultural distance, or some say, oh, the language is different, etc. But what I have seen in this, in the evidence that I had is that the more they, uh, interact with the people in the social network and the less they just keep themselves into let's say people from their home countries 
they they learn, they get into it, they transform a self that is better in uh, communicate communication. And regardless of you know how better in the end they end up with, all participants said they became better intercultural communicators. Some of them probably became much better, some of them less. But I think that interaction with the other, you know, being in touch with them, that makes a difference rather than just hanging out with people who are in the same culture, etc. Uh, and what should we do about it? Well, this is a maybe a policy question that you know we can talk about it on and on. But maybe a simple thing is that uh, we should make sure that students um, do stuff together, and they just they don't just hang out with people from their home countries only. Because if you want to develop intercultural communication uh, skills, you just have to you know start experiencing it, and by doing you learn it. Um, that's one uh, perspective. And then uh, anyhow, the Zachary's question, he said, did they explain any ideas uh, in the way they self-construct? Well, in my um, in my part, uh, which is like, like a, a semi-structured interview part, um, they did not. In that part, I asked questions. But in the previous part, like the narrative part, the first part of the interview, they were free to talk about you know anything that they thought is important. It's just uh, an interview opener. And like from there, I thought new uh, thinking, new ideas may come up. Uh, and yeah, and as, as Simon said, self-formation is this putting, uh, having a, this new perspective that how they uh, form themselves. So that's why I thought having that open-ended part would be important. Okay, uh, I think I answered all four of them. Uh, I hope that was a good answer. If not, do probe me. Uh, we can't hear you, Simon. Sorry, you said that's twice in, in one session. Um, we've got to the end of our um, webinar time, really, because at this point, people start to exit and uh, just after the hour. Uh, and that was a really successful presentation. Congratulations. I think the you know, the approval in the chat is, it gives you a clear indication of how well it's gone down and the slides in particular are really good and clear. Uh, the, um, so we want to have you back on the webinar program at some time in future when you've got either more from your doctoral study or, you know, other projects to bring forward. So I think there'd be a lot of interest in your work. Um, our next webinar, folks, is next uh, Tuesday and it's called Wither the Academic Profession. It's uh, the a summative paper coming out of the CG uh, four-year research project on the academic profession, primarily in the UK with some comparative dimension as well. And the presenters are um, Celia Whitchurch, who leads that project, William Locke and uh, Giulio Marini. Uh, we look forward to seeing you going from soil formation of Turkish students in four countries to the academic pro profession and its, its identity and its aspirations in the UK. So we look forward to seeing you then on Tuesday. And don't forget, as Trevor has been informing you, that we have the um, CG conference coming up on the 11th and 12th of May, a very full program, which either has been posted in the last few minutes or we're about to post. Uh, and you'll see there some of your old favorites uh, from the webinar program and some new faces as well. Uh, and some very interesting sessions with three very strong keynotes the uh, tertiary education coordinator at the World Bank, Roberta Bassett. Roberta Lee Bassett will be the first keynote. We've got uh, Chris Milward from the Office for Students who heads the widening participation program in the UK, which is the big equity program in the UK, is our second keynote. So, uh, and we've got um, panel sessions on mental health uh, in higher education and on higher education and climate change. So, and then a lot of uh, material coming forward from the CG research projects in different panels. So we also have a breakout room facility. You'll be able to create your own group, your own discussion, bring forward your own ideas during that conference. Uh, and we encourage people to use that facility to, um, to go into breakout rooms, to work with others, to flag a, a topic for discussion that others will want to join to and so on. Um, so we want to make it a fully participative conference online as it is, perhaps even more participative than it would be if it was face to face. So we look forward to seeing you next Tuesday at the webinar. We look forward to seeing you at the conference on the 11th and 12th of May. And meanwhile, bye for now. And thanks again to Yusuf and well done. Thank you.